Good morning. Good morning. <laughs> I'm Council Member Margaret Chin, and I'm the chair of the Committee on Aging. I would like to thank my fellow committee member and the council staff for coming together to hold this hearing. Today's hearing will provide the committee with an opportunity to discuss four legislative items. First, the committee will discuss intro number 189. This bill, sponsored by Council Member Danny Drum, would require the Department for the Aging, also known as DIFTA, to implement a program to aid seniors dealing with bedbugs infestations in their homes, including moving furnitures and heavy equipment. Seniors are particularly vulnerable to bed bugs infestations and are often unable to carry out the physical tasks necessary to prepare for an exterminator to rid the home of the infestation. This bill would enable seniors to receive the help they need to ensure that the exterminator can do their job properly so that the bed bugs are eradicated from the seniors' homes. Second, the committee will discuss intro 1185, sponsored by Council Member Deutsch. This bill would require DIFTA to provide information to households with users of life sustaining equipment and individuals with a medical hardship on how to register with their utility company so that they can receive information regarding power disruption and be included in the utility company system's emergency plan. Power outages can be life-threatening to people who use life-sustaining equipment or who have a medical hardship. This bill would require DIFTA to ensure that registration information are available in senior centers, naturally occurring retirement communities, NORCs, or DIFTA's website and the Mayor's Office of People with Disabilities website um, and upon request. Third, the committee will discuss Intro 1616, also sponsored by Councilmember Drum, which would establish a task force focused on older adults re-entering civil society after being incarcerated. The task force would report to the mayor and the speaker on certain data regarding this population and also provide recommendations on how to aid seniors leaving prison and returning to the city. Finally, the committee will discuss Intro 1684, a bill that I sponsored which would require DIFTA to appoint an interagency coordinator to disaggregate the specific programs that are available to seniors across all city agencies. DIFTA's program are only a small portion of city services available to seniors, and it is important that seniors are aware of all city's resources that are available to them. This bill would help reduce barriers to seniors getting access to information and services that they need. I would like to thank the committee staff, Council um, Caitlin Fahey, Policy Analyst Emily Rooney, and Finance Analyst Daniel Krupp for their work in making this hearing possible. Finally, I would like to recognize the committee member that have joined us here, uh, Council Member Rose, Council Member Deutsch, and Council Member Drum. We will now hear a few words from the sponsor of Intro 189 and 1660, 1616, Council Member Drum, the sponsor of uh, Intro 684, Council Member Deutsch. Um, and Council Member Drum has a meeting next door, so we're going to have him go first. Thank you. Thank you very much, Chair Chin, for taking the lead on aging issues and for hearing my two bills today. The first bill is Intro 1616, the Compassion and Assistance for Reentering Elders, or CARE Act, aims to establish a much needed task force on issues facing older adults reentering from a period of incarceration. An increasing number of older adults are facing a, de a destitute dotage. These individuals, many of whom have spent significant periods away from the rest of society, must deal with the myriad of issues associated with aging simultaneously with the challenges of re-entry. Throughout the city, families and communities must also deal with the increasing number of older adults who are coming from prison and jails. Are our city's senior services and programs prepared to welcome re-entering individuals? Are re-entry services adequately equipped to deal with the older population? 
This hearing will focus on the need to address gaps in services. I also hope to hear about models that are working and that the city can tap into. The second bill is intro 189, which seeks to address an ever vexing problem, bed bugs. Thoroughness is key to successful eradication, but this often entails moving furniture and heavy equipment. Without assistance, many seniors would never be able to rid their home of stubborn infestations. I have constituents who have described how chemical treatments applied in their homes by landlords and others were effectively useless because they could not take the other necessary steps. My bill would require the city to maintain, operate, and control a program to provide effective assistance and support for senior citizens to successfully eradicate bed bug infestations, provided, however, that such assistance shall include the moving of furniture and heavy equipment if necessary. I want to thank all the advocates for being here today, and I look forward to hearing your testimony. And I joined the press conference earlier this morning on uh, intro 1616, something that is really very important and close to my heart in terms of providing reentry services for those um, who are elderly and returning from prison. Um, and I want to also state that I have an education committee hearing next door, which I chair, so I'm going to have to leave, but I'll look at this later on, and of course we will be back and forth each other, you know, because you're also on that committee. So thank you for allowing me to make this statement, and um, I will, I will be back shortly. Thank you. Thank you, Councilmember Drum. Councilmember Deutsch. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, good morning to everyone. Uh, today we're hearing intro 1185, 1185, the bill I sponsored requiring the Department for the Aging to conduct widespread educational outreach to seniors who rely on life-sustaining equipment. Department of the Aging would be, would be mandated to provide easily accessible information about how to register with the utility company that provides the electric service. In case of a power outage, registered individuals are given top priority for repairs, and emergency and medical services are alerted to the potential risk that the resident may face without their life-sustaining equipment. When Office of Emergency Management responds to a widespread outage, they were also provided with a registry so they may respond appropriately. This is especially relevant in my district, which is a waterfront community that is made up of more than 30% of seniors. When telephone lines were down after Hurricane Sandy, many were trapped in their homes without any means of alerting first responders to their location. Those who relied on medical equipment to help them breathe were in particular danger with my bill, these seniors will be made aware of the option to register, thereby ensuring that first responders are instantly notified about their status and medical needs. This outreach, this outreach will be conducted in the 10 most commonly spoken languages in New York City. Yes, English will be included. To know more, uh, the more you know, the better off you are, and I urge my colleagues to support intro 1185 a bill that can rely, that can truly save the lives of many. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Councilmember Deutsch. Uh, we would like to invite up the first panel. Yes. Carolyn Retznick, Deputy Commissioner from DIFTA, and Sarah Salone, Mayor's Office of Criminal Justice the Deputy Director of Justice Initiatives. Welcome. Can you raise your right hand? Do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth in your testimony before this committee and to respond honestly to council member questions? Thanks. <clears throat> Good morning, Chairperson Chin and members of the Aging Committee. I am Karen Resnick, Deputy Commissioner for External Affairs at the New York City Department for the Aging. On behalf of Commissioner Donna Corrado, I'd like to thank you for this opportunity to discuss the following legislation. Intro number 189 in relation to providing assistance to seniors with bed bugs in their homes. Intro number 1185 in relation to requiring the Department for the Aging 
to provide certain information to households with users of life-sustaining equipment and individuals with a medical hardship, and intro number 1684 in relation to an interagency program coordinator for the aging. I am joined by Sarah Solon from the Mayor's Office of Cr Criminal Justice, the agency leading the Mayor's Diversion and Reentry Council, who will provide testimony on intro number 1616 in relation to establishing a temporary task force on post-incarceration reentry for older adults. DIFTA's mission is to work to eliminate ageism and ensure the dignity and quality of life of New York City's diverse older adults and for the support of their caregivers through service, advocacy, and education. DIFTA continues its long history of collaborative partnerships with community-based organizations for the provision of programs and services which aim to foster independence, safety, wellness, community participation, and quality of life. Pursuant to the New York City Charter, DIFTA's powers and duties include to stimulate community interest in the problems of the aging, to promote public awareness of resources available for the aging, and to refer the public to appropriate departments and agencies of the city, state, and federal governments for advice, assistance, and available services in connection with particular problems, to cooperate with and assist local neighborhoods in the development of programs, to disperse available city, state, and federal funds to programs throughout the city, and when practical, coordinate such funds with available funding from the private sector, and to maintain, maintain, operate, and control such programs and facilities as may be necessary or required for the proper administration of the department. DIFTA carries out the agency's charter mandate and mission through the sponsorship of community-based and in-home programs for older New Yorkers, such as senior centers, case management, home care, and home-delivered meals. Given that the bills that are the focus of today's hearing are in relation to areas outside of DIFTA's purview, expertise, and budget, the administration does not support this legislation. Intro number 189, Assistance to Seniors with Bed Bugs. Bed bug infestations are burdensome to New York City residents, property owners, and health and social service providers in both the public and private sectors. Though bed bugs are not known to transmit disease, they are a pest of public health importance. As such, the New York City Department of Health and Mental Hygiene, DOHMH, has numerous resources regarding bed bugs focusing on homeowners and tenants, landlords and building managers, visitors and travelers, pest management professionals, health professionals, shelter and group homes, and moving and storage. DOHMH issues a Healthy Homes Guide on preventing and getting rid of bed bugs safely. The agency also provides information on bed bug identification, disposal protocol, pest control company selection and practices, prevention methods in moving and storage, and enforcement protocols for bed bug complaints. DIFTA does not have the expertise nor the budget to address bed bug infestations. Further, older adults can be homeowners, tenants, landlords, building managers, shelter residents, hotel guests, boarding house dwellers, and many other types of dwelling occupants. Maintaining, operating, and controlling a program in the city to assist and support seniors with bed bug infestations who reside in any and all dwellings and successfully eradicate such infestations would be cost prohibitive. Should such a program be a budgetary priority for the council, the administration can explore how to work with contractors who provide this service and have the expertise in this area. Intro number 1185, information for users of life-sustaining equipment and individuals with a medical hardship. Utility providers in the city, Con Edison, pse and &G, and National Grid, maintain information on those who rely on medical equipment that qualifies them to be listed as a life-sustaining equipment customer, or an LSE, making them eligible to register for a priority power re restoration program. This is an opt-in program, and those who want to be registered with their utility provider as an LSE must self-register themselves. They can do so by visiting the utility provider's website or calling their customer service numbers. New York City Emergency Management, NYSEM, also provides information through its website and in its Ready New York materials on where and how to register with utility providers 
and includes this as an emergency preparedness measure to incorporate when developing individual preparedness plans. Among these resources are recommended steps to prepare for power disruptions for individuals who rely on medical equipment that require electric power. Those recommendations include having an altern alternate source of electric power, such as battery backup system, using generators according to manufacturer's instructions and local re regulations, and registering with the associated utility company as a life-sustaining equipment customer. DIFTA's Office of Emergency Preparedness works closely with NISEM in disseminating information to older adults, senior center participants, case management clients, naturally occurring retirement community residents, caregivers, senior service providers, and others. It is important to note that not all users of life-sustaining equipment and persons with medical hardship are older adults, and many of these individuals require a higher level of care and support than what is provided by the services sponsored by DIFTA. Intro number 1684, Interagency Program Coordinator for the Aging. The duty of the Interagency Program co Coordinator provided in the legislation is currently carried out by the Deputy Mayor for Strategic Policy Initiatives who oversees DIFTA. On behalf of the Mayor, the Deputy Mayor helped to marshal interagency coordination in the development of the recent iteration of age-friendly New York City, together with the leadership of the Council, the New York Academy of Medicine, and the Age-Friendly New York City Commission. The latest Age-Friendly NYC report encompasses 86 new commitments for a city for all ages, which builds upon the ongoing success of the original initiatives and includes new citywide endeavors to support older New Yorkers. The great age-friendly work of sister agencies, such as the New York City Department of Transportation under Vision Zero, the New York City Department of Housing Preservation and Development under the Housing New York Plan, and DOHMH under Thrive NYC are all incorporated in the update. Other commitments include launching an acute care for the elderly hospital unit at New York City Health and Hospitals, Harlem, which is designed to meet the special needs of older adults, expanding access to tenant legal services for individuals facing eviction with incomes at or below 200% of the poverty level under the New York City Human Rights, sorry, Human Resources Administration. 40% of older New Yorkers meet this income threshold. Establishing multidisciplinary teams comprised of groups of professionals from various fields, such as district attorneys, the New York City Police Department, HRA's Adult Protective Services, and DIFTA in all five boroughs to respond to elder abuse cases, and recruiting artists to conduct programs in senior centers through the SUCASA initiative made possible through a 2.55 million council discretionary allocation in FY18 and a partnership with the New York City Department of Cultural Affairs. DIFTA remains committed to carrying out its core mission of ensuring the best possible delivery of services to older New Yorkers in partnership with the council, our sister agencies, and community stakeholders. We look forward to our continued collaboration with the council to provide critical programming and information to older adults. I thank you again for this opportunity to testify on this legislation. I will turn it over to the Mayor's Office of Criminal Justice, and I will be pleased to answer any questions you may have following their testimony. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning, Chair Chin and members of the Committee on Aging. My name is Sarah Solon, and I am the Deputy Director of Justice Initiatives for the Mayor's Office of Criminal Justice. I am joined here today by my colleague Jennifer Scaife, who is the Executive Director of Prevention, Diversion, and Reintegration in my office. Thank you for the opportunity to testify today. The Mayor's Office of Criminal Justice advises the Mayor on public safety strategy, and together with partners inside and outside of government, develops and implements policies aimed at reducing crime, reducing unnecessary arrests and incarceration, promoting fairness, and building strong and safe neighborhoods. One of the issues we are here to discuss today, a bill to create a temporary task force on post-incarceration reentry for older adults, should be seen in New York City's larger public safety context. In the last three years in New York City, we have seen an acceleration of the trends that have defined the public safety landscape in the city over the last three decades. While jail and prison populations around the country increased, New York City's jail population has fallen by half since 1990. 
and in the last three years alone, the jail population dropped 18%, the largest three-year decline in the last 20 years. This declining use of jail has happened alongside record crime lows. Major crime has fallen by 76% in the last 30 years and by 9% in the last three. 2016 was the safest year in CompStat history, with homicides down 5%, shootings down 12%, and burglaries down 15% from 2015. New York City's experience is continued and unique proof that we can have both more safety and smaller jails. To drive down crime, arrests, and the unnecessary use of jail even further, our office seeks to enhance the spectrum of criminal justice responses available to effectively match enforcement to risk and need. In April 2016, the Mayor's Office of Criminal Justice announced a strategy to continue safely reducing the Rikers Island population by connecting eligible individuals to effective interventions before and after jail. The strategy involved the creation of the New York City Diversion and Reentry Council, a multidisciplinary council of 54 organizations and agencies, including city government agency representatives, the courts, district attorneys, defenders, providers, members of the faith community, formerly incarcerated individuals, and advocates. The council reviewed data on populations and available options, and and develop solutions to address unmet needs and improve program effectiveness. Two subcommittees dedicated to diversion and to reentry were created. Each year, roughly 45,000 people return to New York City from jail and prison. Pre-jail and post-incarceration programs in the city currently divert roughly 10,000 people from jail. The new strategy ensures that reentry and diversion resources are being used as effectively and efficiently as possible to reduce jail use safely while promoting public safety. This strategy aims to drive New York City's crime rate even lower by reliably assessing who poses a risk of recidivism, appropriately addressing the issues that have led many into contact with the criminal justice system, and connecting people with stabilizing services that can help ensure that they do not return to jail. Since May 2016, the Mayor's Office of Criminal Justice has worked with the Diversion and Reentry Council to accomplish the following. First, we are comprehensively understanding the populations in need. We are currently conducting a deep analytic dive to understand the risk, service needs, and characteristics of the target population in order to identify opportunities for intervention. Additionally, we are mapping the available interventions and identifying gaps. So we are working to comprehensively map available interventions across diversion and reentry points by creating an electronic catalog of New York City's justice and service providers. We are de identifying existing gaps, which will help us to determine what additional resources or partnerships are necessary to address these gaps while promoting public safety goals and where we should reinvest resources that may currently be supporting less effective programming. And we, uh, and third, conduct direct outreach with currently incarcerated individuals to better understand reentry needs. The mayor's office and partners learn directly about the needs of detainees to better understand what circumstances one could, would contribute to their well-being and their ability to be able to take full advantage of reentry services. Last year, work groups of the Diversion and Reentry Council identified individuals who are sentenced to 30 days or less in jail as a target population for diversion initiatives. We are in the process of implementing new programs to divert these individuals, many of whom have 26 or more prior misdemeanor convictions and are over the age of 40. Key service interventions include cognitive behavioral therapy to address thinking errors, trauma-informed services, Medicaid enrollment, linkage to health care, including substance use treatment, and connections to transitional employment. Additionally, a high utilizer work group of the Diversion and Reentry Council was recently formed to address the needs of people who regularly enter both jail and shelter and also have high use of emergency departments or Medicaid. Many high utilizers are older adults who have cycled through public systems for years. They have significant trauma histories and longstanding behavioral health needs and often have experienced years of housing instability or homelessness. We are working closely with various city, city agencies to better understand their needs and help them stay out of public, uh, out of the jail and shelter systems. We will reach out to the Department of the Aging uh, to invite them to participate in these efforts. In October, we will have preliminary recommendations and by January, we'll, we will have a full high utilizer plan. Reentry services are critical to preventing recidivism and ensuring that people leaving the Department of Corrections custody have opportunities to embark on a productive and stable path. Last March, the city announced it is building a spectrum in which every person who enters city jails will be provided with new tools and services that will help to promote a stable future. 
by addressing vocational, educational, therapeutic, and other needs in an individualized way, time inside jail can be used productively to lay a foundation that can prevent future interaction with the criminal justice system. <coughs> The administration's new system will begin with expanded risk and need assessment on the first day that someone enters jail, offer five hours every day of programming that addresses an individual's unique needs, and continue with support, including new employment and educational programs, after someone leaves jail and returns to the community. A 2013 RAND Corporation study showed that participation in prison education, including both academic and vocational programming, was associated with an over 40% reduction in recidivism saving four to five dollars for each dollar spent. By the end of 2017, every single person who enters city jails will be meeting with counselors starting on day one who will assess their unique risks and needs. These counselors will work with detainees to develop an individualized approach for their time in custody that will include efforts to identify vocational and educational needs and help them connect with the right programs during their stay. Everyone in city custody will be matched with five hours per day of vocational, educational, and therapeutic programming that will help lay a foundation to best support long-term stability after release. The administration supports the goals of Intro 1616. Ensuring individuals are re-entering their communities with stabilizing services and transitional employment supports to address their unique needs is a key element of ensuring that they do not return to jail. As such, the administration has already begun examining the unique needs of older adults who are often the same individuals sentenced to 30 days and are high utilizers of the city's jail and shelter systems. Our office has concerns about any legislation that would duplicate our existing initiatives and investments. Given this overlap, we propose that the aims of Intro 1616 be achieved through non-legislative means. We appreciate the city council, council's interests and look forward to continuing to work together. Thank you for the opportunity to testify here today. I would be happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Um, since we have the education committee next door, so council member have to go there and check in. And so do I, but I, I have to chair this committee. Okay, I'm going to start off um, with some questions. Um, I'm going to wait for the uh, other council member to come back to ask their question. But I'll, I'll start with um, the um, legislation that I sponsor, uh, Intro 1684. Um, So, Deputy Commissioner, in, in your testimony, yes. um, you were talking about all these um, services that are available. And so, everybody knows DIFTA, and seniors know Department for the Aging. Um, so, how do seniors um, receive this information about city services or other government services? that they are eligible for? I mean, do they have to actually go and look up every agency's, or can they just come to DIFTA and be able to find all the information that they need? So I'm not quite sure exactly the question. If it's services, are you asking about services that are provided by our agency or services provided by the whole city of New York? All city of New York. But everybody knows DIFTA. So okay. if I'm so when people I come want to know to what I can qualify for or <clears throat> what programs are available to help, to help me. First thing senior think about is Department for the Aging. Okay, so we are in the process and in fact just have our beta and about to launch our new website, which has a tremendous amount of information on it for seniors and links to programs and services that could impact older people that are provided by other city agencies. We have a community outreach team and an intergovernmental team that attend all of the interagency council meetings, many of the district cabinet meetings, local community board meetings, we go to health fairs, we get up to just about everywhere that we're invited and bring with us materials not only about our own programs and services but of other agencies as well. And of course, one can always call 311 
or use Access NYC, where you can screen and apply for the plethora of benefits and entitlements that one might be eligible to. So I think there are a great many ways that seniors can access services, and if they are unfamiliar with other ways to reach other city agencies, they can always come to us and we direct them to the right place. I didn't mention New York Connects, our new program, which also um, provides a great deal of information and assistance to older people, as well as in senior centers where we have case assistance. So do you, when an agency consider adding new programs, you know, do they do any analysis on the senior population or how this new service can benefit them? Do they consult with DIFTA? In the majority of times they do, I would have to say that our commissioner, Donna Corrado, has made it her business since she became the commissioner to make sure that we are on every other agency's agenda. So we have spent the last uh, four years doing that. Um, and if agencies don't reach out to us, then we reach out to them. So we try to make sure we always have a seat at the table. Okay. Um, now, so, do you have any um, insight on what city services that apply to seniors are currently underutilized? We know that there is, un I, I didn't bring data with me, but we know that there's underutilization in the SNAP program. We work very, very closely and collaboratively with HRA. We've been doing data matching, sharing our data, trying to find and locate seniors who could be eligible. Um, the same with SCREE and the Department of Finance. We have an extremely close working relationship with them. And again, the same, we've tried to um, not only do data matching with our own agency, but linking them up with HRA, um, working with Robinhood and others trying to find ways to do outreach and target and find seniors that could be eligible. So those are the, the two big entitlements that I'm, I can think of that are underutilized by seniors. What about services that, um, that apply to seniors that are the most utilized? Do you have any idea on that? Like what services the city provide that a lot of senior use There's, of course, the federal programs, such as Medicare and Medicaid, which have a very high usage by seniors. Um, not sure what you're looking for. Well, I mean, do the senior now knows that if they are facing Eviction. Landlord harassment, eviction, that there are legal services available to them. Um, yes, they do. We've been also working with HPD, and in fact, they've come um, to the Age Friendly Commission to talk about their portal and how seniors can apply for low income housing, which is, of course, one of the biggest needs for older adults. Um, so by sharing information with our sister agencies, we try and get the information out to all the seniors in the city of New York. Now you, in your testimony, you were talking about this, uh, the age, new age-friendly NYC report. I mean, you quoted a lot of stuff uh, from there. So is this report gonna be updated annually and and, um, and also how is this the uh, implementation is gonna take effect? We have not made a commitment to update it annually, but we do want to update it. It's, a, it's quite a heavy lift, but in the process of doing that, we convened basically all of our sister agencies in the human services world, and that has really helped to strengthen our ties with those agencies, and it's the work of each of those agencies to continue on the implementation. We, we ourselves will not necessarily implement every program, but we'll be working with our sister and partner agencies to make sure that these initiatives um, are successful. So in your testimony, you're saying that right now you don't have anybody 
um, in DIFTA that serve this role of uh, coordination and uh, with the the inter with the other agency in terms of the services they provide for the senior. But you said that the deputy mayor um, for strategic <coughs> policy initiative that oversee DIFTA is doing this role. Yes, the agencies that report to the deputy mayor all collaborate. We have a liaison who is specifically assigned to our agency um, who works to make sure that we are a part of all the other major initiatives going on in the city. And myself and our director of intergovernmental relations essentially serve in that role as being the coordinator for our agency. Okay, so you're saying that you're doing that job. Yes. And don't you? Along with Ms. Ventura. And you think that's sufficient enough? <laughs> I think we have excellent relationships with our sister agencies. They know to reach us. We, you know, when they have issues, complaints, uh, sort of the elected official offices, I, I think people know how to find us. Okay. Oh, Councilmember Dorge is back, so I'm going to take a break and give him an opportunity to ask some question about uh, his legislation. Councilmember Deutsch. Yeah, thank you. So I will, uh, good morning, Commissioner. Hi. Um, so I was unclear from your testimony if, uh, if you support, if the Department of Aging supports the 1185. Can you collaborate on that? I think the answer to that is that we don't. Um, particularly because we don't see it as our role or function as we are charter mandated. And um, I can actually call on some of my sister agencies to help with the response to that. Um, yeah, you want to come up here? Thanks. Good morning, uh, my name is Eli Frescas. I'm from the Mayor's Office for People with Disabilities. Uh, we work closely with New York City Emergency Management um, on supporting uh, public outreach for people with disabilities in disasters. Um, I, I don't believe emergency management was available today. Uh, I think they are uh, busy at work uh, given the um, hurricanes that are currently impacting uh, Puerto Rico, et cetera. Uh, so what we do at the Mayor's Office for People with Disabilities is we link many of the resources that are available to constituents uh, with disabilities in emergencies. So we do have links currently on our website to emergency management that gives information for LSE customers. So define to me uh, people with disabilities. If someone is disabled in a wheelchair, let's say, they're not in life-sustaining equipment. But if someone is in a hospital and they just got discharged with life-sustaining equipment, so what do you consider that? Someone, a people with disability? Uh, a person who is utilizing life-sustaining equipment uh, is a person with disabilities most, most but likely. But you wouldn't have that person on your list if that person was not this, a person with disability but ended up in the hospital and just came out, got home, and is on a life-sustaining equipment. So it's not something that the person was disabled all along that you would know he, who he or she is. No, we would not. That's the responsibility of the utility com company, PSC and G, Con Edison. They are the ones so that- So you're saying, uh, we just had a brownout a few minutes ago. So Con Edison is not reliable. So when it comes to services, we have blackouts and power outages and brownouts like we just had all the time. So if we cannot rely on Con Ed when there's a storm, if there's a uh, high winds, so how can we as a city rely on Con Edison to do outreach to people who will in return give them a lot more work and for them to register that their address, their home address, has someone who's on life-sustaining equipment. So I, don't you think it would be the city's responsibility, uh, Department of Aging, 
to um, do an education outreach. I never heard anyone say that there's too much education. Uh, and when you talk about OEM, they do a phenomenal job, excellent job. But if you ask anyone in my waterfront district that if they look at one of the pamphlets the OEM gives out, which is excellent, has a lot of resources and everything, but it doesn't single out when someone's in life-sustaining equipment. It could tell you that you must evacuate. It could give you information, you know, go find a, you know, prepare yourself and have a, you know, that in case something happens, you should go to a family member, um, stock up on food. But when it comes to someone's life, if someone's in life-sustaining equipment and that person is home, and many of the seniors have families that live out of state, out of the country, Many seniors I know in my district don't have family. And when you're talking about a young, a young adult who's, you, you mentioned in your testimony that it doesn't have to be a senior, but chances are someone that is younger that ends up in life sustaining equipment, they have family members, they have brothers, they have sisters, they have children, they have aunts, uncles. And many seniors are just left alone and they don't know and they can't fend for themselves. And we as a city must protect them must stand up for them, and I think that having an outreach uh, to seniors and people with disabilities, and to everyone actually, but in particular seniors, that um, this is what you should do, very simple. People get scammed every single day. We have an outreach that if you receive a phone call that um, we just kidnapped your grandchild, right, don't send the money call 911. And why do we do it to seniors? Because they are the ones that uh, lose $5 billion each year in the United States of America because they fall for these scams. We're talking about someone's life. During Hurricane Sandy, we had a life lost in my district. I don't want to see something like that repeated. So you're talking about OEM. Does OEM have this outreach in 10 different languages? Can you answer that? So, so I, can't, I can't speak for OEM, um, but I can speak to what we link to in our, in our MOPD website, Mayor's Office of People with Disabilities, and we link to their access and functional web page um, that also has information on my emergency plan and really about community outreach through uh, Ready New York. So again, I can't speak for OEM, but I know that they have a very robust um, outreach where they do go out to the community to do these events for personal preparedness uh, for people with disabilities. So what specifically does it mention in the pamphlet or what you're talking about that already has this outreach? And what, what specifically does it say? So New York City Emergency Management, and, and again, um, I can't speak for emergency management, from, but from the brochures that I've seen and what we support on our website at the Mayor's Office for People with Disabilities is the My Emergency Plan, which gives lots of information for people, um, ev everyone really, but also people with disabilities on how to prepare for disasters. It has information about making sure that you have your medication, that you have doctor's does information. It, does it mention that you should register your home address uh, with Con Edison if you're in life-sustaining equipment? Yes, it does. It does mention that? Yes. And in how many different languages? Uh, I, I don't know, but I know that they have a very robust um, language access protocol at emergency management. When I've spoken with them, it seems like they've had every brochure that we've ever needed here at the mayor's office. How often do you uh, give out this brochure? Uh, well, we have it in our office that we give out to everyone whenever they come by, if they're our constituents. So, so first, you, you mentioned that it's on the web. Many seniors don't have computers to look on the web. Uh, many seniors in New York City um, don't speak English as a first language, so you don't have it in 10 languages. Um, you also said that you have it in your office. Um, so I know that my office is in my district, and if a senior or a person with disability cannot come down to my office, I would have a staff member visit them because who's going to go to your office to get this information? How many, do you have a number of people that you could tell me right now statistics of how many people actually go to your office to pick up a pamphlet? So in addition to people coming by our office, which, you know, it varies from day to day, um, I would say it's, it's within 20 people or 30 How many people, people live in the city of New York? And, and so... How many seniors are there in the city of New York? That's a question for DIFTA. How right? many people with disabilities are there in the city of New York? 
uh, there's n roughly 940,000 people. 940,000, and you have 20 people that come in a day? That come to our office, Any but that's just, one, that's just one way of, um, of doing outreach. And again, this is a question for emergency management, and they're ready in New York. Uh, people who go out into the community, they do um, literally hundreds of events each so, year. So if for someone, example, it's, you know, it's, when, you, when you give information that someone should prepare themselves and go out and buy food, that's pretty common sense, but you need to remind people. Um, when you tell people they should evacuate, right? Now, after Hurricane Sandy, people would be a little more proactive, but you always need to remind them. But, you know, and many of the things you mentioned in your pamphlet, it's like a reminder to them. It's common sense stuff, but we need to remind them. It's always good to remind people. But when you, someone needs to register with Con Ed, and you don't know about it, you're not reminding them. You need to do education outreach to tell Can them I, that this um, is what I, you should I just, do. Just w the comment here, though, is um, it, you know on our website we currently have links that link up to the utility providers in order to get the LSE Many senior, many people don't have computers. But, access right, but that's to computers. within the, that's within the bill. So I'm just saying that we already currently do that. So. Uh, and I, may I add to that that DIFTA has an entire unit on emergency management run by Assistant Commissioner Linda Whitaker. And we do hundreds and hundreds of outreaches every year. Um, right now, if you come into our office, we the whole reception area is devoted to Ready New York and um, the whole month of preparedness. And we partner with NYSEM to go to senior centers and we do um, collaborative presentations. I have a question. If you, if you do a poll today, um, how many seniors are there in the city of New York? Over the age of 60, 1.4 million. 1.4 million. And you have about over 900,000 people with disabilities. So if you did a poll today to the 1.4 million seniors and over 900 people with people with disabilities, asking them <coughs> about if they know about registering their home address with Con Ed, if they're in life-sustaining equipment, then in case there is a power outage, Office Emergency Management should know that they must have emergency services respond there, and Con Edison would then in return know that this, these are the areas we need to turn back on the electric and make it a priority. How many people do you think would actually know that? I think people who are on life-sustaining equipment know that. Um, people that are on life-sustaining equipment um, but if someone comes out of the hospital, right, and the hospital does not do the outreach and does not tell people to be in life-sustaining equipment, uh, so if someone comes out of the hospital and he's out of the hospital for a month or two, right, or three months, they may not know that they should register their home address. Because I know I've spoken to people who are in life-sustaining equipment and they weren't registered with Con Edison. And this is so important because OEM are, it already exists. OEM. Mm -hmm. Currently, if there's a power outage in any neighborhood uh, due to a windstorm or a hurricane, they already know to call Con Edison and get this list of all the people that are on life-sustaining equipment. It's, it already exists. Mm -hmm. Everything is already in place. I have seen it firsthand, and I'm constantly speaking to Commissioner Esposito, and the first question that I ask when I call OEM when there's a power outage uh, when I call OEM, I said, how many people are in life-sustaining equipment? And they have the answers to it. This whole thing already exists. What doesn't exist is the outreach to the people. If we need to lose one life because someone does not know that they should register the home address with Con Edison, then shame on us. I personally called up Con Ed to see how long it takes to register and it took under two minutes just to go through the process to register someone. And all we need to do is education outreach. It's going to cost the city some money, but this is going to a good cause. And I do think that the Department of Aging and your office should be proactive and be involved in this education outreach in 10 different languages. Because how many people that don't speak English as a first language how many people do you think know that they should register with Con Ed? Because the material that you are sending out, 
The people you are sending out in senior centers, which we appreciate, do not speak 10 languages. And I have a very diverse district. We have a very diverse city. And the fact that everyone came in here with the mindset saying, I'm not supporting this, and not having the information, because uh, you said OEM is not here, with not having that information, is just unresponsible. Because we're talking about lives. We're talking about our seniors. And seniors are living longer. So chances are that I just went to a birthday party. I actually went to three. 100-year-old constituent, 101 and 105. Yeah. Seniors are living longer. We're fortunate for that. And chances are, as they live longer, we hope that they don't end up in life-sustaining equipment. But many of the caretakers don't speak English as a first language. So the caretakers wouldn't even know. So I really don't understand how everyone comes here with the mindset saying, I'm not supporting this. This is people's lives. I just we want have, to clarify we have, we that... Have, we have, we have uh, unfortunately now with what's going on around the world and now in Puerto Rico, right? This could happen any time here in New York City. If you walk outside today, it's very windy. Trees are coming down. You'll have plenty of, I could go on the Con Edison website to see how many power outages there are. This is a bill that we all need to support. Whether you're a senior, whether you're a young adult, uh, we all need to support this. This is, it's, this is really, my favorite line lately is unacceptable for us not to support our seniors and our people with disabilities who are in life sustaining equipment. So just to clarify for the record, we absolutely support doing outreach and education and making people aware of the opportunity to register if they're on life sustaining equipment. This is definitely We are not supporting legislating that because we think we're doing a good job and I'm sure we can do more and now that you've highlighted the issue we will make sure that we continue to do more in this area. So um, again OEM has a plan in place you are doing outreach we work and with I thank them you for that. We do our own outreach, but yes. I don't agree that we have enough outreach I think that we do need we do need to legislate sometimes um, to make sure that this outreach is done. We have outreach all the time. We have voter registration outreach. Mm -hmm. We have outreach in different languages for people to go out and vote and what they need to do. We have outreach all around the city where it's legislated. We, we do legislate because the reason why we put in bills is because we don't feel that enough is being done. And this bill is very crucial because of not only what's going, around, what's going on around the world, and we see it happening. And I have personally been making phone calls to people that I know in Florida and other areas and other parts of the United States to see how they're doing. And, um, you know, if, if, we're, if we're making phone calls, it's not just me. People all over New York City are making phone calls to relatives, to friends, to acquaintances, people they know. They care about those people. So we need to care about the people in the city of New York, too, and make sure that, yes, if, there's, if we feel there's not enough outreach, and I could tell you if you do a poll today, right, people don't know because they'll be surprised. Oh, how come I wasn't told about this? Why do we have to do outreach so people should put smoke alarms in their homes, right? Because you want to prevent the death, and we need to do outreach. Is the fire department doing enough outreach? They do plenty of outreach, but it's always not enough. I never heard anyone say that we have too much outreach and we need to do more. So I, I still don't understand that um, why the administration is not supporting this bill. It's a common sense bill. It's pretty simple. And I think our taxpayers will support something like this and not spend money on other nonsense. And this is an important bill and this bill will save lives, guarantee you. So I'd like to get the administration support. I think this is totally unfair for everyone to come in here and not supporting this bill and have the mindset by saying, no, we're not supporting this bill because we do enough education. Do schools do enough education? There's, we could always do more. Do senior centers do enough education? We could always do more. Can I just... Um... I'm not going to stop until I get the commitment. <laughs> I have all day. It's a holiday tonight. I'm going to stay all day. But I, I wanted to help you with that. I'm going to be here till sundown. <laughs> I'm going to help you with that because according to the mayor's management report, the Department of 
for the aging, promote a minister and coordinate the development and provision of services for older New Yorkers to help them maintain independence and participation in their communities. Now, we're not talking about just emergency. Yes, OEM, they do their part. But there are seniors who, as the council member said, might have just came out of the hospital or all of a sudden, because of some health reason, they have to use some special equipment um, that relies on electricity or whatever. Um, and we also have some not so good landlords who in harassing, you know, resident can do something to disrupt utilities and things like that in the building. Um, so it's so important for seniors and people with disability to know that they should register. And I agree with the, the council members. We can always do more outreach, especially for a lot of the homebound seniors who don't go to the senior centers and seniors who don't have computers. So there are a lot more that we can do. Response? I agree with that we could Thank you. do more outreach. Thank you, Commissioner. Thank you for your support. Now can we get your support? I did not support the legislation. And we cannot do outreach and be responsible for all New Yorkers. We are a small agency with a small budget. The legislation does not specify just outreach to seniors. And homebound seniors, should they be on our case management program, clearly in emergencies, we do tremendous preparedness to make sure that all our homebound are prioritized, that the frailest of those have whatever supports are in place, and would certainly educate about being on life So this bill is not to send out a mailer to 1.4 million. It talks about going to senior centers, doing education outreach in senior centers, in NORCs, in the libraries, in other areas. But So it's, it's not going to be that costly um, to have this done in 10 languages and to do, you're already doing outreach in senior centers and everything and else, and this languages. is just having another piece of paper, another flyer doing outreach by bringing an additional information, which you're already doing, right? Yeah. And this is just bringing additional information to those senior centers and NORCs and libraries and other areas where you're already doing outreach at those, that location. So I don't see how this is going to cost, um, this is costly because everything is already being done. This is just giving another piece of information separate from everything else to let people know that this is what you should do. All right. I mean, the information, and I can share with you what's on the um, Office of Emergency Management's website. Yeah, many seniors specific. don't have, many seniors don't have computers. Well, we share that information in Ready New York. That is already, and it's in multiple languages. That is what we use to distribute, to educate people about the opportunity. So to I would ask you if, if it's possible, if, if you could do a poll and just as you, you have people going around to different things, how many people, how many seniors would know that, that this is what they have to do? I mean, to me, this is very simple and really common sense. And everything's being done. OEMs are already doing, we're not mandating OEM to, okay, you must work with Con Ed. They're already doing that. Right. We're not asking you to do anything special more than, than you're doing now. You're already doing outreach, yeah. but this is to expand that outreach by giving them separate information that this is what you need to do because of the many power outages that we have and all the storms that's been going on now. And it's, it's common. I need to work with you and meet after this hearing if, if you feel that we need to develop a, a separate outreach piece of material. I'm sure that's something we could work on with emergency management. Um, but th this is something that I would like to see that will continue uh, that once this bill passes, I'm hoping it passes. And I'm hoping this comes into, you know, I'm hoping to get the administration to support this bill. But I think it's really, it's really unfair that, um, you know, this is not going to be costly. Unless you have numbers right now telling me how much, how much it could cost. I'm sure you don't have that. That if this bill passes, do you have any numbers of how much this bill would cost? No. If it does pass? If it should pass? So... We're in the hearing here. We don't have information about the OEM stuff that we spoke about. We don't have information of how much this would cost if it should pass. 
right? So how can we just throw things out saying this is costly, we're already doing this, we do have this information in some book that has 50 other things in there that are mostly common sense stuff that you're reminding people about. Um, you know, we don't have all that information, so how can we even have a hearing on this bill today if we don't have that information and by everyone telling me we're not supporting this? Anyone? You know, I can only really speak towards what the mayor's office of people with disabilities do, and we work very closely with New York City Emergency Management but in all facets of emergency management, particularly community outreach. We do fairs, we do symposiums, we do working groups, we work with them on a myriad of different uh, approaches and When was the last outreach. time you had a fair in my district? Uh, I, I, I don't know. You don't have that. So you don't have any information today at a hearing when we're hearing my bill. So if you're going to say That's a so question for if, emergency if, management. You, if you're going to say but something, you need to back it up. I was so a, a, so if you tell me that we have but I, I mean, 50 I, fears, I, I just find health that fears throughout the city at this and this time. And all the work that we, we do We reach out to office. thousands, tens of thousands of people. If you, you don't have any st stats, you don't have any, it's all, it's all talk. You don't have any. Then I can only speak to what, what the mayor's office does. And we do do a number of community outreach events with New York City Emergency Management. We're committed to it. We believe in what's called whole community planning. Okay, I'm going to ask you again. When was the last time you did an outreach? And I'm going to tell you again, I, I, I don't know your particular I, district. I will say that literally two weeks ago we you have a number of how community, many outreach how many we were at a community what? event in Staten Island two weeks ago uh, I speak with emergency management daily so you went to that you went to Staten Island you speak to emergency management daily so but I still don't think you do enough outreach because you can't answer the question in my district and that's why we need to legislate that this should be more outreach that's and education that's not part of the legislation or the legislation here asks for us to put information about LSE through the utility companies on our website, which we already do. And to do outreach to people in neighborhood NORCs. That's a question for DIFTA, not for, that's not what's in the legislation. Councilmember Member Deutsch, um, we have a few more panels. They don't have the information that you need. I would, so I would like to. We're I would asking like to. the mayor's office, who's here today, um, set up a meeting with Council Member Deutsch because as with any legislation, there's got to be discussions, right? Mm -hmm. So you know that he is Happy the to meet with you. Bill, happy so. to talk about what we're doing and, and identify if you so think I, that I, Okay. Gaps. I would like to know, um, I would like to discuss offline then how we could support this legislation, how we can make it work. And since you don't have the numbers, or maybe we could have another hearing on this bill. Mm -hmm. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. We've been joined by uh, Council Member uh, Valone. Do you have any uh, question before I? Okay. All right. I am going to talk about bed bugs since Councilmember <laughs> Drum is not here. So, if there's a senior who has a bed bug problem, if they call DIFTA, what kind of help would the senior get? I mean, it seems like from your testimony, you kept focusing on Department of Health. Yes. So, and I have colleagues with me today from the Department of Health who might want to come up and join me. Department of Health is the go-to place. As a matter of fact, we have unfortunately had to package up our own little bed bugs and bring them over there to have them identified. So we know firsthand how, how that works. So maybe you could walk through a little bit of the protocol and what DOHMH does in terms of bed bugs and how to mediate, And also maybe, do you have any example of seniors calling uh, DIFTA when they have a bed bug infestation and how DIFTA helped them resolve that? We, of course, link to Department of Health and Mental Hygiene's information. We have our own information. We do do outreach about what to do if you have bed bugs. We do get some calls, not many. Um, Oftentimes, it's our most vulnerable seniors, and they may become or already are part of protective services. 
and I know that they have helped in, in very special cases, particularly of hoarders. So they tend to be unique and really sort of the most impaired or lacking in, in competency. And um, I do know that APS and our assigned counsel project have gone in to physically help or pay for remediation in extreme circumstances. So if a, a senior is under or have adult protective services, then you're saying that they would have all the assistance that we talked about um, in the legislation, that they would have people who help them Yes. Clean up, move the furniture, and make sure that exterminators. But if they don't have adult protective service, but they still need assistance, how does DIFTA coordinate with Department of Health to provide that assistance if a senior calls you? We have only had the resources to help in really exigent cases that are, you know, really emergencies. And other than that, people have to use their own resources, friends, neighbors, the for-profit uh, companies that do the remediation who will do the moving and the lifting and whatever, you know, it takes in order to um, clean up an apartment. I mean, what about... Depends on what type of dwelling we're in. That's what makes this more complicated. If, if it's in NYCHA, if it's in, you know, a nursing home, and there are different regulations around different types of housing, supportive housing, et cetera. If it's in a hotel, if it's a tourist, if, you know, it, to say every senior residing in the city of New York in any type of dwelling is, you know, above and beyond anything that we could... Uh, manage, and regardless of income. But what about, I think it might be helpful if we hear from DOHMH yeah. what exactly one does if they think they have a bed bug situation. Sure. Thank you very much for the opportunity to be here. My name is Anna Caffarelli. I work with the Injury and Violence Prevention Program at the New York City Department of Health and Mental Hygiene. Um, and I can give you a, an overview of, uh, of how we handle um, this, this grave concern, of course, about, um, about bed bugs in New York City. Um, as as uh, Deputy Commissioner Resnick referred to in her testimony, our role is, is mainly educational at the Department of Health and Mental Hygiene. We have uh, a number of educational materials um, that describe myths and facts related to bed bugs, um, prevention strategies, mitigation strategies. Um, while we do have a small um, enforcement role, uh, very limited, um, with respect to some um, pest management plans, um, we do not have a role in bed bug abatement. And, um, and I will also, you know, we're a city team, of course, and I'll also um, mention that we have uh, colleagues here from, from HPD, from Housing Preservation and Development. Um, it, is, it is my understanding that HPD handles complaints due to bed bugs and also um, distributes educational material, um, and that HPD also does not have a role in bed bug abatement specifically. Um, what I would like to offer, of course, is that um, we can connect you to um, my colleagues at the health department who are experts in the, the bed bug realm. Um, that, that's not my particular background, um, but I did want to give you that, that overview of, of the health department role. Well, that's why this legislation is so important. Nobody take care of the, the abatement part. It's sort of like if a senior or a person with disability needs help, where do they go? So maybe now is a good opportunity to call up HPD to talk about what the landlord responsibility is and the role that they play in enforcement. Thank you. I have. <laughs> Thank you. This is how we work together collaboratively as an interagency <laughs> partnership. Good morning. I'm not convinced. <laughs> Hi, I, I'm Mario Ferrigno. I'm the Assistant Commissioner for HPD's Division of Code Enforcement. And uh, HPD is the agency charged with uh, uh, responding to 311 complaints and enforcing the Housing Maintenance Code with respect to maintenance conditions in uh, resident, uh, uh, tenant occupied residential dwellings. And uh, if we do receive a call uh, uh, regarding a bed bug complaint, uh, we dispatch an inspector uh, after first notifying the owner of the condition. 
uh, if the owner does not uh, correct the condition or if the tenant does not confirm to us that the owner has taken some steps to correct the condition, uh, we will dispatch an inspector uh, who, if uh, confirms the bed bug condition, will issue the violation. Violation is uh, sent to the registered managing agent who is, in fact, responsible for the remediation of the condition. Um, as you probably already know, uh, we have, all of our inspectors are trained to identify and issue violations for bed bugs, and we also have a canine unit with two uh, beagles who identify uh, uh, and a team with an inspector uh, to identify bed bugs. Madam Chair, if I may. Yes. Uh, Mario, just on what you're following, I, I think underlying this legislation is always our cry to see if there is a senior in need. So this is where my concern with this bill and every bill is, how can we get services to seniors who are plagued with 17 different agencies to try to find out what to do? So you had said when you dispatch the inspector and if they find a condition, what's the next step? A notice of violation is issued to the owner. The owner is provided with uh, uh, a Class B violation uh, with a uh, notification to correct the violation by a certain date and to certify correction uh, to HPD. So the owner is served with notice, the senior or the person still has bed bugs on the bed. How do we get to the step of getting that corrected? Right. So HPD is, is the enforcement piece. We do not remediate bed bugs. However, um, once violations are issued and owners do not correct conditions uh, as they're required to, they f face potential litigation. Uh, they face uh, potential civil penalties. There's a step involved the, there where the tenant or the person who's suffering can be given some type of steps of procedures on how to get relief in the situation instead of just seeing an ins a ticket being by, uh, issued to the landlord. Should it be some type of guide given to the senior saying these are the different services that are provided by the city, this is where you can find help, this uh, is where... Our inspectors are also equipped with the Department of Health's uh, uh, bed bug uh, guide, which they do provide to tenants uh, uh, upon completion of their inspection for bed bugs. So that information is, is handed to the uh, tenant. And where I'm going with this is my more important question, is what if they determine as a condition beyond bed bugs that there's a dire living condition going on in the apartment and it's beyond the scope of the inspector to address? At what point, with all this wonderful collaboration and coordination with agencies, do we now start to focus on there's a larger problem for this person, this senior? It might have started with the bed bugs, but once you get entry, doing guardianship work for my entire life, the minute you get access to the apartment or the home, there's a clear concern that either the person can't take care of themselves, there's a, other health concerns in the problem. What's the next step between your office and now notifying DIFTER, APS, Department right. of Health? Our, Department our of agency buildings? works with uh, Adult Protective Services, and if our inspectors uh, come across a situation as you described, they would make a referral to Adult Protective Services. And how do we get, and Karen, that's what we so, so from the moment that happens, how does the coordination begin between APS and DIFTER? Department of Health once there's a condition underlying that's more important than the bed bugs. And if it's a, if it's a referral to APS, we they don't necessarily refer back to us. We make referrals to them. Um, I am aware, and, and HRA is not here today, but they do help with remediation um, and do what's necessary in order to eradicate the situation. And I mentioned earlier that if we have case management clients that have very serious situations, you know, we have some access to emergency funds or we've had private funding where we can help. If Perfect. So that's what I was really, saying. So if you have you that know, case management system extreme, in place, yes. right, and now all of a sudden something is flagged with someone that has an existing case within DIFTA, um, and now there has been an inspection through Department of Health or Department of Buildings that is any of that information get included into the existing case management or is it a separate incident and they don't get related? I honestly don't know if we would know if you've issued a violation, I doubt it. We would know if there was a bed bug situation in, in a client's 
department. And a lot of that work is working with the landlord to make sure they get in and, and remediate the problem. I mean, it is at their expense and their responsibility to do that. No, I'm with you. I'm just trying to dig deeper onto the next step on how we can coordinate. We've done it with Rikers, with detainees and inmates coming forward. We keep their health records for whether it's recidivism or coming through so that right. the medical department, there's always a file ongoing with a particular person. So if we were to open a case file for someone, it might be as, I don't want to say simple as bed bugs, but that's the tip of the iceberg. And now all of a sudden it turns out we have to open up an entire file for that senior that we could now coordinate and contain that person's records so we can coordinate visitations, whether it's APS, whether it's DIFTA, whether mm -hmm. it's Department of Health, following I up with the landlord. I think we learned in preparing for this that when HPD issues a violation, they, they don't keep that data based on age. So there's no way of them being able to say a senior has been, you know, infected. Yeah. So we, what do you think? Maybe don't, we can do something. We don't know the age of the th caller to 311, and we don't inquire, uh, with two exceptions, which are uh, triggered by the law, which is the uh, uh, child protection laws for uh, lead paint hazards and uh, window guards. Other than in those two instances, we don't inquire about uh, the age of the tenant. Well, I mean, the hardest part for us as, as legislators is often getting access to an apartment or a house or a building, and here we have access. So I'm wondering how to s utilize that opportunity if there's a person in need um, for some type of future plan we can put together if something is witnessed. Obviously training, you know, the, the health inspector is coming for a different reason than the building departments than the APS, I, I understand that. But the idea is to provide assistance to the senior or a person with a disability or a person in need or often it's a parent taking care of an older child and vice versa and there's very fear in letting people into that situation. So maybe we can talk about at a future hearing with our chair, uh, coordination of that data to provide really a global plan for when someone actually calls city for services and it might start with bed bugs. That's the reason why something simple is a bed bug call but now all of a sudden we're getting into the heart of what maybe it was the landlord completely just blowing the situation and letting a bed go from, from tenant to tenant to tenant. However, it might be something else going on. So maybe we can talk about that in the future. Absolutely. Thank you, Chair. I guess if the, if the call came in to DIFTA, most likely, I mean, you would know whether it's a senior or not. Um, and then you can also right, follow up whether it's case management agency. Because one of the concerns that we've heard is that um, that for a, a homebound senior, right, if they have home attendant, um, how do we make sure that the DIFTA contract, the, the home care worker, and enter the home of a, a client who has bed bug? You know, if they don't, then all of a sudden this homebound senior with a bed bug situation will not get any kind of help. Um, so that's, that's something that we want to make sure that there's service there to help these seniors in need. Because I, all I hear about is enforcement and, you know, and then Department of Health with all the guidelines, but there's no real assistance to a senior who's going through that um, situation. I mean, there's a lot to do, right? You gotta clean all the laundries and you gotta put everything together, get move furniture. I mean, the senior in that situation is not gonna be able to handle it. And that's where they cry out for help. I mean, I'm not sure if adult protective service is the only way um, to get them assistance. Is that what it is right now? I'm not aware of other city services besides protective services. And a few cases that we've had either at case management or through our assigned counsel programs. So, you know, sometimes eviction is bed bug infestation is, becomes part of that whole process. Well, that's something that um, information as a follow-up we wanted to get from HRA um, in terms of like in case of situation with seniors and bed bugs, how, you know, how does uh, APS come in and do they provide the help and assistance? And so we should get some um, information on that. Do we do 
just you want? I think what we'll do is that since we have other panels of advocates here, and we wanted to hear from them. Okay. So I wanted to um, thank you all for testifying, and we're going to send you all the follow-up questions that we didn't get answered to. And I hope that we have will follow -up meetings. Yeah, continue to follow up and then discuss how uh, we can get the administration on board to support this legislation. Thank you. Thank you. On the next panel, Alexander Riley, Volunteers of Legal Services, Elderly Project. Andrea Siafani, Live on New York. Molly Kukrowski from JASA. Yes, good start. Okay. Good morning. Uh, my name is Molly Krakowski. I'm the Director of Legislative Affairs at JASA, and I'd like to thank Councilmember Chin, members of the Aging Committee, for the opportunity to testify today. JASA's mission is to sustain and enrich the lives of aging New Yorkers in their communities, enabling them to connect with people and places that give them meaning. JASA's programming promotes independence, safety, wellness, community participation, and enhanced quality of life for New York's older adults. Our varied programs provide continuum of care to over 40,000 clients annually. Um, I'll start with intro 1185. In the aftermath of recent hurricanes and power outages across Houston, much of Florida and surrounding areas, um, and obviously what's going on today, there's a heightened awareness of the potentially devastating impacts of the most vulnerable members of our community. JASA commends the Council for introducing 1185, which will require the New York City Department of Aging to provide information to households with users of life-sustaining equipment and individuals with a medical hardship on how to register with a utility providing electrical service. Providing information to older adults at senior centers in Norks, as well as having easily accessible information on the website, on the New York City website, will expand the reach of the city and hopefully help connect individuals to the appropriate providers. Previous hearings on emergency response and resiliency have addressed the concerns of advocates as well as city agencies in maintaining lists of individuals utilizing life-sustaining equipment in case of emergency. Of significant concern is how to keep such a database up to date and accurate so as not to waste the precious time and safety of emergency responders. In 11, um, 1185 supports individuals in advocating for themselves by educating them on the steps to take in order to notify their utility companies while avoiding potential disclosure of private health-related information to landlords. The responsibility of notifying the utility company rests with the individual in need of services. Uh, and I'll just, um, I, not as part of this, but just in response to Councilmember Deutsch, I agree that um, although we have plenty of information on Get Ready New York and all of those booklets and we give out um, and have them all the time and people have their go bags, um, I don't see any reason not to have a standalone flyer information that highlights the need for people to register. It seems uh, easy, easily done. Um, intro 189. As bud bugs have made their way back into the spotlight in New York City, JASA has worked closely with staff and clients in trying to prevent and respond to outbreaks. Bed bug infestations can happen anywhere and people may unknowingly transport them from place to place on their clothes, luggage, and other goods. 
Infestation can be small um, and isolated or more extensive and complex. Bedbugs cause a variety of negative physical health, mental health, and economic consequences, including various physical reactions to bite, mental health implications for people living in infested homes, and time-consuming and expensive control measures. Jess is pleased that through uh, intro 189, the City Council makes clear its understanding of the particularly negative toll bed bug infestations have on older adults and aims to assist older adults in managing outbreaks in their homes. Jess seeks to prevent, mitigate, and contain bed bugs and similar infestations in our offices, program sites, and apartments. We've invested significantly in trainings and protective practices for staff. Prevention is the most cost-effective approach to managing bed bugs and can work in a wide range of settings. Trainings include focus on being respectful and sensitive to clients when asking about their home and being vigilant in observation of any risk. We also maintain resources online and access for all staff. Despite preventative measures, outbreaks are inevitable with a client base of over 40,000, approximately 1,000 staff members. JASA works closely with a pest control company with action plans including deployment of bed bug sniffing dogs at JASA housing, senior centers, central offices, and customized treatment plans, sometimes including removal of furniture, thermal heating, and cryonite flash freeze treatments. Unfortunately, bed bugs pose a significant challenge for older adults and treatment is costly. And to that end, JASA welcomes any assistance the city is able to provide. And that may mean, as, as the Deputy Commissioner mentioned, working with contractors. Obviously, we're not the experts in moving furniture and, and doing the actual um, getting rid of uh, bed bugs. But if moving furniture and dealing with the um, intense um, nature of actually readying apartment for um, for extermination is is very uh, intense and very challenging for an older adult. Um, INT uh, 1684. Uh, JASA supports um, this intro, uh, which requires the Department for the Aging to establish an, an interagency program coordinator position to advise the commissioner on all city programs relevant to aging. Uh, the interagency program coordinator would also be responsible for an annual report to the mayor and city council on aging program uh, programs citywide. There are often programs and services impacting older adults which are administered by city agencies other than the Department for the Aging, whether it's Human Resource Administration, Department of Health, Mental, uh, Mental Health, Department of Homeless Services, Parks and Recreation, et cetera. It's important that in a city as large as New York City, there's adequate coordination and reporting of existing services. INT 1684 will complement the already existing H-Friendly NYC partnership of the Mayor's Office, New York City Council, and the New York Academy of Medicine. An annual report to the Mayor and City Council will provide a clear picture of the ways in which older adults are considered in city planning and service coordination, and it will serve as a mechanism by which the city can measure its effectiveness in addressing the needs of older adults. Such a position may also result in the added benefit of educating other city agencies about the needs of older adults in the community and areas for the city to improve service delivery. And I'll just add one note, which is that the um, age-friendly NYC resources are incredible and vast, but I don't know how many people know about them. Um, so often we you know, talk about all these great, wonderful programs and, and options for people to get educated and higher education and and, you know, utilize city services, but they don't necessarily know about it unless they're already connected. So I thank you and um, pass it along to Andrea. Okay, uh, good morning. Still, still in the morning. Okay, good morning, uh, uh, Chairwoman uh, Chin and uh, Councilmember Vallone, and thank you very much for the opportunity to speak this morning. Um, so I'm Alex Riley. I'm the director of the Elderly Project with an organization called Volunteers of Legal Service. We're located on Worth Street, uh, walking distance from here. Uh, just briefly, we run uh, a series of uh, small legal projects in a variety of uh, areas of legal practice. Mine, the Elderly Project, does two things. I run legal clinics offering advice and referrals in a, various, a variety of subject matters throughout Manhattan, including one walking distance from here at 100 Gold Street. And I also work with uh, volunteer lawyers at our partner law firms to obtain wills, uh, powers of attorney, advanced directives for our clients. Prior to running this project, I was a staff attorney at the Legal Aid Society's uh, Brooklyn office for the aging for several years, where I worked with a lot of clients with bed bug problems and litigated cases involving this issue. So I'm very uh, pleased that uh, 
the committee uh, is proposing this legislation. Um, first of all, I think that uh, the the problem of bed bugs for seniors is is a problem uh, for reasons other than. Um, uh, simply that they are not able to move large furniture, as has been discussed before. Uh, remediation, eradication requires a lot of additional steps, um, from removing curtains to bagging things, and people with uh, even insubstantial disabilities or um, uh, lack of ability to do various things are, will be challenged in this regard. In addition, many of the, pro uh, the seniors who have this uh, problem of, of bed bugs in infestation are quite isolated. Earlier, the Deputy Commissioner of DIFTA mentioned uh, the prospect of friends and neighbors helping. Well, as we know, there are many isolated seniors in this uh, city who have no friends and neighbors at all. So that's, for many people, that's not an option. We all also, have friends and neighbors until we need a mattress moved, and then nobody picks up the phone. <laughs> that's the end of that. Excellent point. Um, <laughs> Also, uh, seniors and, and many people are often reluctant even to report the existence of bed bugs because there's a lot of um, uh, misperception about whose responsibility it is to eradicate. Earlier, the, the HPD representative pointed out correctly that it's the landlord's responsibility, but many seniors um, believe that it's their problem. They have to eradicate, and they don't know how to do it, so they don't tell anybody. And this causes further problems. The, the, bed, the infestation gets worse. And in some cases, the landlord will actually uh, bring a hold of eviction action on the grounds that the, that the tenant deliberately um, omitted to, to alert anyone about this problem. So that this uh, thereby exa exa exacerbates the problem. And finally, as was mentioned before, uh, many studies have shown that clutter does increase. Uh, the the um, proclivity to uh, clutter one's home, one's apartment does increase as one ages. So the older the senior, potentially the bigger the problem if there, if there is a big bug infestation. So, um, so I certainly uh, uh, support this bill. I agree with DIFTA, though, that perhaps the, the idea of having this apply to every conceivable home, no matter how one defines that, might, might be challenging. Um, but certainly, the, the, the majority of the people I deal with, they live in uh, rental apartments, co-ops, that sort of thing. Uh, the, those people absolutely need help. And that must, I would say, fall within the, umbre within the umbrella of uh, seniors' homes, as the, as the legislation uh, describes it. Um, a couple of other points I, just, I wanted to make about uh, the, the legislation it's, uh, the way the legislation is drafted, the legislation sp uh, says specifically that DIFTA will assist with uh, the movement of heavy objects. But uh, as we know, the problem for seniors extends well beyond that. I mean, it, it, if um, an, an impaired senior needs help uh, beyond just moving the dresser, I mean, they have, there's lots of things that need to be done. Um, and generally, in my experience, when APS gets involved, it's, you know, they're in there to do more than just sort of helping to bag things. They'll, they'll do much more substantial work, which often involves what they call a heavy-duty cleaning, just getting rid of a lot of stuff. And that's, what's not, that's not what's needed in many of these instances, a somewhat more careful approach. Um, also, to the, to the discussion earlier about HPD's role in um, making authorities aware of this uh, problem in individual instances, certainly when HPD is, it does show up in an apartment and inspects, finds a violation, places violation for uh, bed bugs, they can alert DIFTA and whoever else. But many bed bug infestations are never reported to HPD, or if they are reported to HPD, HPD, um, there's no telling how long it's going to take for an inspector to get there, if they're even going to get into the apartment. So I, I don't think that um, it's wise to rely solely on HPD to, um, to uh, contact DIFTA if, in fact, DIFTA is, or whatever authority is going, going to be of assistance. So, um, it, it occurs to me that there are other potential uh, informers, so to speak, um, who could be mandated um, in, in, along the lines of a landlord's duty to uh, inform a marshal of the presence of, a, of an elderly person in an apartment um, prior to an, uh, to an eviction, and then the marshal is supposed to notify APS. Perhaps um, it 
could be required that if a landlord or an exterminator um, is aware of a bed bug in infestation in an apartment with an elderly impaired person, then the landlord or the exterminator should make uh, a, a referral to DIFTA or whatever authority is um, going to be handling the situation. Um, and in terms of outreach, I mean, there's been a lot of discussion of the importance of outreach and education. Uh, clearly, this is critical in this case, and uh, it occurred to me that uh, perhaps the Department of Finance, with all of its mailings and outreach um, on, uh, to SCRI and uh, SHE beneficiaries, could uh, coordinate with DIFTA uh, in this regard. And so the last thing I wanted to say is that uh, something that I learned in, in my litigation practice at Legal Aid was that uh, this issue is, this is a broader problem than just with respect to bed bugs. I saw a lot of cases where uh, elderly people had housing code violations in their apartment, but in order for those violations to be corrected, um, large furniture needs to be moved, and these violations may have had absolutely nothing to do with bed bugs. For example, repairing damaged flooring, which posed a, 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 a trip risk, uh, a fall risk to the to the seniors, and typically landlords would say, "Well, you know, you've got to move that furniture," and the seniors would say, well, "I can't," and the landlord would say, "Oh, well, it's too much of a liability for my people. We're not going to move it," and absolutely nothing would happen. And this this was an issue that came up very frequently, and there was no clear resolution to it. Um, you you really couldn't force the landlord to to move uh, these heavy objects, and there was no one else who was willing to do it. So it would be great if at some point uh, the committee could, could consider legislation that would offer this kind of service with respect specifically to heavy objects uh, for any kind of housing violation, housing code violation uh, that was impacted by this inability to move uh, furniture. Thank you. Good morning. Good morning. I'm Andrea Gianfrani. I'm the Director of Public Policy at Live On New York. Uh, we would like to publicly thank Mayor de Blasio and the administration, as well as the DIFTA Commissioner Dada Carrado, for recognizing the value of investing in senior services in the FY18 senior uh, year of the senior budget, which added a historic $23 million in new baseline funding to community-based services that serve older adults, um, as well as funding through the council. And we would also very especially like to recognize the efforts of Councilwoman Chin and Councilmember Vallone and the Aging Committee, as well as all senior or all of um, City Council, for your strong and very vocal and sustained leadership um, throughout this year of the senior, which we look forward to c continuing to do. Um, I'm just going to comment uh, briefly on two of the bills being considered here today, so I'll just jump right into that. Intro 1684, um, Live, on New York, Live on New York supports this legislation. As we age, we build an incredible amount of momentum, and older New Yorkers across the five boroughs are using this momentum to power up the economy, the political system, and our communities. Many older New Yorkers remain the anchors in their neighborhoods and families, providing in invaluable volunteerism, care caregiving, and activism. Recognizing and bringing this momentum of older New Yorkers to the forefront will continue to take a very coordinated effort by all agencies in all parts of the city. By doing so, New York City will gain this energy of older adults going forward and truly make this a city for all. Core to our mission to make New York a better place to age, Live on New York advocates that when policy and community development ideas are being discussed, and when policy decisions are being made, whether it be about a neighborhood rezoning, the development of a new community space, neighborhood safety, service delivery for benefits or business development, stakeholders and decision makers must take in the perspective of how those relate to older adults. We recognize the leader, leadership at, the, at DIFTA under Commissioner Corrado as a strong voice for aging services and older adults. In addition, we support the idea of city agencies being accountable and reporting on how they are also meaningfully serving the needs of older adults through their programs, resources, and services. This could be anything to ensuring that they understand uh, basic, basic things like that agencies might need to consider when they're holding public forums um, that seniors might be more apt to attend if it was during the day versus later in the evening. And also, um, and another example is with, with neighborhood rezonings, ensuring that discussion also focuses on the needs and supports in that proposed rezoning as it relates to seniors and in addition to schools and business development and job opportunities. So these are some, some areas that we think are really useful to be addressed through this legislation because it's not only the services that agencies are offering, but it's also how those agencies look at how they offer their services to older adults and making sure they're, they're taking in the perspective of those, those offerings. 
We also strongly advocate that the city makes continued investments in DIFTA's overall infrastructure so the agency will have increased resources to serve the New York City's growing older adult population as we move forward. We also believe that this legislation and understanding the work of these agencies and how they are doing systems delivery will help us understand as a city how, if there's any needs and gaps and help us um, plan through the budget for those needs going forward. 1684 would also strongly bolster the important work currently underway by the New York Academy of Medicine through the Age Friendly Commission, specifically those initiatives that were outlined in the recently re- report that was released in August. For these reasons, uh, Live on New York strongly supports um, 1684. Um, I'll also just briefly comment on uh, 189, the bedbug legislation. Um, we're not taking a position at this time, but as um, both Molly and Alex mentioned, as well as other testimony that was um, presented here today, it's a very complicated issue and, and we do believe that it's important to address the needs of seniors and taking into account all the complexities that happen um, with these situations. We are also, in all of our work, constantly focusing on the needs of the isolated and those who do not have uh, community supports um, and that do rely on the services of the city, for example, through the case management system who can help serve older adults. Um, concern, again, with this legislation is that it is not um, does not come with funding um, attached to it in the legislation, so we would want to make sure, again, um, echoing Molly's comments, that it's an expensive and complicated process, that there be um, funding that um, would be considered if if this is something, um, an idea that's that's looked at, because it's a very complicated situation. And again, we don't want that responsibility to fall on community-based agencies um, when they're not equipped to do so, both um, financially and in other ways. Um, The other, I will add again to 1684, the previous um, legislation that we would say the same thing, is that because of the complexity and the needs of addressing seniors in the city, we'd want to make sure that that um, position, if created through this legislation, would be um, fully and strongly um, supported financially by the city so that that position can do the incredible amount of work that will be asked and will be needed. Um, So again, we thank you for the opportunity and also wanted to recognize that it's Senior Center Month and the um, incredible work that member agencies such as JASA and many others do on a daily basis to serve older older New Yorkers. Thank you. Thank you very much uh, for your testimony and uh, for some of your suggestions. So this way we will have, um, you know, more backup when we negotiate with the administration on this legislation. So thank you for being here today. And just real quick, I think what we've determined when you have hearings like this is that there isn't a clear plan in place. And that's what always gets all of us as the advocates, because as we all are, concerned. So something as simple as a bed bug question turns into a larger question, and then have agencies all bringing other people up to the table and saying, I think it's this person, I think it's that person, and that's not a plan. So legislation gets the question on the table. Funding will come the more we get advocates and more council members, and the steamroll till June comes. But if we don't start it now and have our great chair advocate for things like this, we won't get there. So I I clearly see the need for a coordinated effort um, to start this process to make sure we don't lose seniors in the world when we have an inspector come and there's no follow-up. When we have a landlord who says, I can't do it, uh, or have a tenant or a senior who says, I don't know who to call, and we have all these great city agencies saying, maybe it's this one, maybe it's that one. So we need to come up with a better plan. So thank you. Thank you. Okay, I apologize if I pronounced your name wrong, but I can't read the handwriting that well. Uh, Safina Bandow from Megar Everest College. Oh, okay. Francis Mamuri from Our Our Children. Uh, Nuriden. Kabir from Fortune Society and Fernando Martinez from Osborne Association.
Please identify yourself for the record uh, before you speak. And just make sure your microphone is on. You'll see a little red light there if it's not. I don't think it's on. Can you push the silver button? There you go. Rosalie Cutting from Black Veterans for Social Justice. Did you fill, excuse me, ma'am, did you fill out a form? Oh, okay, we, we haven't called you yet. But she, I don't think she's here. Oh, uh, the person from Maker Evers College, Safina. Laura Whitehorn, is, is that your name? No? Oh, you're over there, okay. So do you want me to replace Rosalie and she goes later, or what are we doing? You're going to be on the you're going to be on the next panel. Yeah. You can just have a seat and then you come up. Yeah. I'll come. You want to start? I'm going to start. No. <laughs> okay, who's going to start? Ladies first. My name is Frances McMurray. Please uh, put the mic on and make sure the button's on. It's on. Okay. My name is Frances McMurray, and I am for formally incarcerated, um, being released only last year at the age of 62. There isn't anybody in the world that has never asked for a second chance. No one. And never more important than somebody that is being released. However, coupled with being released, is the fear of reentering society, being unable to navigate without the proper resources, housing, employment, education, um, anything that is needed for the reentry into society. And we just need more help in that area. I work with our children. I was very fortunate that I obtained housing with our children and employment with our children. However, I do witness a lot of people, especially older people, they're having the difficulty, they didn't get the skills or they don't have the skills needed to obtain employment. Um, they can't find housing. They don't have family um, or friends that can help them. They've been ostracized or disowned by their families because of shame on you, mom, how, how dare you get into, into trouble. So we can't house everybody, we can't help everybody, but somebody's got to help effect change and to, and to provide help. It's, it's, it's scary. There's terror on, on behalf of the person coming out of prison because if you don't have a plan before you reach that gate, it's too late. You're going to run around like a chicken without your head because you're so busy trying to find housing, you're terrified you're never gonna find a job because you have the stigma of having a conviction next to your name or a state ID number, and you end up returning to old, familiar people, places, and things, which helps keep the recidivism rate high because you had no other choices. And I see a lot of people that never had the choice growing up so they don't know any differently. 
and I'd like to see that change. Good morning. My name is Nuruddin Kabir, and um, I was released June 16, 2016, after doing. Can you pull the mic closer? Okay. I was released June 16, 2016, after doing 507 months, which comes out to 42 years, three months. And I have almost tripled my sentence. I started out with 15 to life. And uh, most individuals who do long prison sentences, no matter what people think, they have no idea what they're going out into the world to experience due to the fact that certain prison rules and restrictions don't let you deal with a computer. You don't have Bluetooth. You don't have certain electronic surveillance equipments. You don't have certain Medicare and Medicare practices. So when you go out, the first thing I experienced was seeing people talking to themselves in the street, which made me think that everybody was crazy because we don't have Bluetooth in jail. And upon seeing that, I said, what am I been sentenced to? And when you see new technology or you see buildings where your house used to be and you see new money going into the bathroom and you, the t things come on by itself, all the electronic, all the new equipment and stuff like that, it's overwhelming. When you have people who have spent a great deal of time in the penitentiary educating themselves to be released to a society that won't accept them, what do you do? Well, a lot of the seniors, we automatically start looking at the youth because if you don't protect the youth, you will have no future. Myself and others like me, we have dedicated our lives to when to trying to save some of the kids now, to save them. I tell people that I helped destroy the community that I was in 40-something years ago. And I no longer am the same person. When I went to jail, I was 33. I'm 76 now. And whatever I did, I can't change that. But I want to re be remembered, as well as many other seniors, for the good that we do now. If, 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 if the society doesn't utilize us to help straighten out the conditions, then society is going on a path of failure. The same manner in which you advertise for people out of Wall Street who are retired executives and you utilize their experience. You should utilize the seniors who come out of jail for the same reason. We know what to do. We have lived it. One of the mistakes that society makes is I nicknamed it the West Point Syndrome, meaning you'll send a person to college in West Point to come out a second lieutenant to go and fight a war where they've never been as opposed to the soldier who became a sergeant who was in the trenches for years. You, you can't keep making the same mistakes and thinking that you're gonna solve the solution. Utilize those people who have spent that time in jail to try to save your youth, to try to ensure that you have a better future. Because if you don't save the kids, you got no future. You don't have it. We, in turn, want to help but we can't get it all the time. We never filled out any paperwork before. We don't know nothing about uh, HRA, SSI, anything else like that, because we weren't exposed to it until we were instantly put on the street. When we were put on the street, what did we see? A whole new world, a world in which didn't exist when we were incarcerated only thing that closely resembles being in touch with reality is looking at the television. And that's fantasy. The reality of it is the most hurtful thing that I've seen since I've been home is seeing individuals, men and women, sleeping in the streets. Because when I look at them, I say, that could be me. 
and I'm thankful that the Fortune Society and many others who are like them accepted us and helped us because we're here, but don't waste our talent. We can help you clear up this mess because it's a mess. You might not see it, but if you've never been to jail, you don't know what it's like to be in there. You have no idea. I don't care what somebody told you. Live it for, for a year and see what it's like. One of the things I advocated many years ago, I said, if you send every kid that's reached a certain age, use the scared straight tactic. Let him go to jail for a year, not on the real side, but as a training, you would save a lot of them from going back to jail. But without that, the gangs, the peer pressure, the drugs, the things that attract people, they're gonna fall into that spider's web and they're gonna get it sucked up. And if you don't save the kids, like I said, you're not saving your future. You're making your job harder. Because from now, you, you're, not, you, you're not gonna enjoy seeing your grandchildren or your great-grandchildren being sentenced to a time that you won't even be allowed to visit in the future because you're gonna be dead. I had three children. I lost one, but I saved two. I saved two. My daughter became a CEO. My son, he, he, he made it. I lost one child. And I got a grandchild. And she came to see me. And she's all right. But I would love to help all mothers and fathers not see their kids going to jail to be sentenced. The North is much better than the South because they execute them down South. They execute them. They don't. They don't take no. They don't take no, no shorts, as we say. And I thank you for letting me talk. And I appreciate it. And thank you for being here. Thank you. I want to also thank my colleague for sharing his story. It's a story that we often hear at the Osborne Association. My name is Fernando Martinez, and I am the Fulton Project Director, and I'm speaking on behalf of Laura Roan, who is the Program Manager for the Elder Reentry Initiative at the Osborne Association. The testimony that I'm about to provide is her testimony um, as the Program Manager. For two years, the Elder Reentry Initiative, with support from the Osborne um, City Council ATI funding and Council Member Gibson's Fund for Senior Services, along with several foundations has provided geriatric assessment and discharge planning services to incarcerated older adults prior to their release, and then comprehensive case management services post-release in New York City. These services offer returning citizens individualized age-appropriate care to ensure a successful reintegration to our communities. As you will have heard from other speakers, such as my colleague next to me, or my two colleagues. And a written testimony submitted by Tanya Krupat, who's here today, director of Osborne's Center for Justice Across Generations, older adults are the fastest growing demographic in prison. Yet to our knowledge, we are operating perhaps the only program in the nation that serves the transi transitional needs of aging people in both jail and prison setting and provides a continuity of care from pre-release through one year post-release. The program operates in Riker Island, Rikers Island jails and three New York City, New York State prisons, as well as five, as well as in the five boroughs of New York City. As you may be aware of it, due to Osborne's request to the city council for the past two years to fund this work. Since many other before me today have spoken on the challenges associated with incarcerating older adults, I'm going to speak to Osborne's unique experience on the front lines of working with this older incarcerated population. Osborne's Elder Reentry Initiative initially focused on seniors released from incarceration after 10 or more years in New York State prisons, but has since expanded to include older people being released from Rikers Island jails. The populations are quite dissimilar as Rikers Island participants 
often have chronic substance use issues, unaddressed mental health concerns, and extensive periods of homelessness. They find themselves mired in cycles of detention, homelessness, drug-related crime, and rearrest. Our participants with 10 or more years of incarceration, however, face distinctly different challenges. In both cases, we begin with a geriatric assessment that is especially modified for the incarcerated. Their struggles with crime and sobriety lie decades behind them, but their age creates new barrier. They face a world that has changed dramatically since their arrest. Cell phones, Wi-Fi, touch screens, metro cards, the internet, apps. All of these are foreign to them. Key family members have died or moved away, and their aging bodies often cannot work in the job sector they left behind decades ago. Because it is hard to imagine what, entry, what reentry looks like for someone incarcerated 20, 30, or 40 years, I would like to share the story of one of our participants, Tyson, who we met at the prison gate and escorted home on the day of his release. The story begins months prior to his release, when I met with Tyson to begin finalizing his release plans. He had been granted release after his sixth parole board hearing and after 35 years of incarceration. Tyson was awash in emotion. When I approached Tyson in the prison waiting area, he had been crying for 20 or 24 hours since he's been notified about his parole decision, leaving him with red, swollen eyes. In our prior sessions, he had expressed what he had, that he had, was depressed, anxious, and lonely, and was so grateful that he would soon be released, living with his mother and free. His mother's health was declining, and he was thrilled to be able to go home to her and to care for her and spend time with her. Release day was overwhelming for Tyson. Tyson, at 61 years old and 35 years incarcerated, he didn't know how to buckle a seatbelt, how to turn on his cell phone, or how to operate a touchscreen. When he held money in his hands for the first time in 35 years, he asked me if it was real money, because the colors, tape, um, typeface, pictures, textures had all changed. He said the only thing he recognized about it was the smell. He said he'll get used to using Monopoly money. <laughs> Several times in the initial hours of freedom, Tyson broke down in tears, overcome with emotion. Tyson brought almost nothing with him when he left prison. He had given most of his things away to his incarcerated peers. He wanted to shed everything about prison life as quickly as possible. The prison ID, the release clothes, the soap smell, so we took him to a store to get a few essentials like a razor and socks. In our experience, people with extensive time behind bars make so few decisions for many years that their decision-making muscles atrophy. And shopping can be overwhelming for many of them. Tyson was no different. When it came time to pick out new boxer shorts, Tyson was completely flummoxed. He felt paralyzed and unable to make a decision though the choices were limited to just two options, plaid or solid. <coughs> mm -hmm. When he couldn't decide after several minutes of thinking, we flipped a coin, grabbed the associated pack of underwear, and kept shopping. Minutes later, he took me aside. Miss Laura, can I please get the other boxers? In prison, we aren't, we're, we aren't allowed to wear stripes, so I'd like to get the plaid instead. Of course, we march right back and exchange the solids for the plaid, but the moment struck me solidly. Tyson's recovery and reentry were going to be grueling for him if the plaid solid decision was so paralyzing. Beyond that, he was going to have to figure out who he was as a human without the yoke of incarceration on his shoulders. Was he stripes or was he so a solid man? Would he always pick up the not prison choice, or would he be able to recover, reestablish his own identity, and truly be free? I'm happy to report that after four, almost four months of being released, Tyson was, has recovered his ability to make decisions 
and he's living as a purposeful pro-social life. He helps his mother with her daily living needs. He is actively looking for work. He's still working on mastering technology, but he embraces the challenge. He found his laugh again, and his anxiety, depression, and loneliness seem obliterated. Tyson's success is typical of our, of our participants. We have, we have had only one participant rearrested. Our comprehensive adaptive care management means that each participant receives compassionate assistance tailored to her or his needs. However, Osborne's elder reentry initiative serves only a small fraction of the seniors released from New York City jails and New York State prisons every year. So most reentering seniors do not have someone to help them learn how to use a metric card, a seatbelt, or a touchscreen. They do not have transitional housing, medical appointments, or relapse prevention services in place prior to release. Instead, they often are lost and alone. Released back to the homelessness, mental, mental illness, and substance use that led to, them, to led to them to incarceration in the first place. Almost, uh, although Osborne is currently redeveloping the Fulton Correctional Facility in the Bronx to provide transitional housing that will prioritize older adults, the demand is far greater than the question as we were able to go afterwards remains. Unless re-entering adults are prioritized for senior and supportive permanent housing. For all these reasons and more, we endorse Councilmember Drum's proposal to create a temporary task force to address post-incarceration re-entry for older adults. Thank you for the opportunity to speak today. Okay, good afternoon, I think now it is. My name is Laura Whitehorn. I am representing Release Aging People in Prison, RAP, and I am formerly incarcerated. I had the good fortune, largely because of my privilege in the society as a white person, to have family and friends who were able to take care of me when I got out of prison. Um, and I want to take us for a minute out of this hearing room. Um, we had a press conference this morning, uh, which was a lot of people and a lot of formerly incarcerated people and their families and a lot of support for 1616, and we really appreciate that it's being brought up. Um, and we appreciate that it's coming out of the aging committee because just to a little show and tell, so one of our submissions today is this book, Aging in Prison, Reducing Elder Incarceration and Promoting Public Safety. RAP began, I don't know, 2012 or 13, we can never remember because we were planning it, because we saw the, the exponential rise of the number of elders in prison across the country. And the statistic in, in New York is that since 2000, the overall prison population in New York fell by about 27% whereas the population of people 50 and older went up by 98%. And this is largely something that is not the concern of the city council. It's because our state agencies, the parole boards, were not letting people go, and because of the, the massive rise of the thinking that you have to keep people in prison, people don't get a second chance. So that also, though, creates a context for this hearing, because if there are 2.3 million people in prison in the United States and all of those people have families, then anything that affects the incarcerated and formerly incarcerated population affects everyone in the community as well. So this booklet began because when we started to work on RAP, we were asked by people, where are people going to go? So we contacted the Department for the Aging to discuss this, and they had never thought about incarcerated elders as part of their population. And immediately they saw how important that was. And with DIFTA and the Osborne Association and RAP and some other groups, we, be, we set up the Aging Reentry Task Force, which worked for about a year and a half um, to do a study of the issues facing elders coming back into the community and created a, a case management plan, which is in the back of this book, which is um, part of what 
uh, Fernando was talking about, about the, um, the elder reentry initiative that, that is being practiced. And it is the only one, or maybe there's one other, Dave, I'm not sure, I think it's the only one in the country that is dealing with reentry needs of older people. That tells us that this task force is needed here. Um, I, we also have in our submission uh, a report from the state controller, Thomas DiNapoli, about the crisis of aging in prison, which also talks about the need for looking at release, more release mechanisms for older people, and that means that we need more reentry. I would also just point out, when I got out of prison, because I was in prison during the height of the AIDS epidemic, I did, and Fareed, Mujahid Fareed, my co-founder of RAP, he did too, um, AIDS education and counseling in prison. This is before protease inhibitors, it's before any of the good medications. And so when I came out, I worked for t about 12 years at Paz Magazine, magazine for people with HIV. And we studied the issue of people with HIV getting out of prison and how over the years uh, programs were developed to institute con continuity of care and how those programs that were designed solely for H people with HIV then influenced how reentry was done for other populations. And so we feel that the 1616 is so important because whatever we figure out among us, and it is people who've been there who have to help be very much part of leading this process, will then affect issues of homelessness for people who aren't formally incarcerated. It will affect how housing programs are set up for all kinds of vulnerable populations. So we think that's really important. Um, I wanted to say something about, I didn't, couldn't hear totally, but I think the mayor's office was, was saying that they are doing uh, all kinds of reentry uh, work and that this is not necessary, but I think that I don't want to use the word ridiculous, but I think that what we've heard and what you will hear from other people is that there is not, it's not just that we could always do more, like was being talked about with Diffin and stuff. It's that there is just not enough and that it hasn't been modeled with the expertise of the formerly incarcerated. So RAP, which is contacted all the time by, I mean, we're a tiny, bunch of people, but we're contacted from all over the country and around the world because we're people who said this is a problem and the, the solution is to let people out and create good reentry. And the mayor's office did not reach out to us. I don't know if they reached out to any of the other um, groups doing this work. So I just want to end by saying that this issue of elder reentry is one which we appreciate the city council getting behind. We do think that there's one change that we need to make, or a few, but the one I'm gonna talk about to the, the legislation as it's written, is that I think there's room in it, it's mandated to have one formerly incarcerated person. We think there should be at least three, if not more. And that's partly because we don't want a token. We want, like when we talk, if we talk about what it was like for you to get out of the state and me to get out of the feds, we'll come up with a different, I, we'll, we'll end up with something different than we started with. If we talk as a woman and a man getting out, we'll talk about things that are, we'll end up with different answers than we started out with. So we would urge that, that the city council recognize that the expertise of the people who've been there, not just because we have the experience, but because we understand what the problems are. We understand what the emotional effects are because we've lived, through, not just because we've lived through them, but because we've conquered them. And that's what this, what I think is so important about 1616 is that it will recognize that not only are the people closest to the problem, closest to the solution, but that those of us who have survived this and have overcome it have some really good ideas and spirit to put into this problem that we have to solve. So thank you very much. Thank um, you. So this is the 10th copy. Thank you so much for your testimony. And we will you know, push forth on this legislation uh, for the things that you have testified. It's such a great need. I mean, the 
one question that I have, I mean, from the, uh, the mayor's office of criminal justice, you know, their testimony that they have this uh, strategy involved creation of this New York City Diversion and Reentry Council. Were any one of your organization contacted for that? We were not. I had to turn back to my colleague, Tanya Krupa, but we were, we were not from the Osborne Association. Okay, because they mentioned all these, you know, faith community, former incarcerated uh, individual advocates, but they didn't invite any one of you. Right. Okay. Well, thank you. Thank but you. thank you for your testimony, and we will uh, continue to work with Council Member Drum uh, on this legislation. We're going to call up the next panel. Uh, Rosalie Cutting, also from RAB. Sabini, uh, Sav Safina. Okay, you're back. Your last name is Bag Bagdali. Oh, Bagdali. Okay, from Maker Evers College. Uh, James Royal Royal from Brooklyn Defender Service, and Teresa Montini from the Brookdale Center uh, on Hunter in Hunter College. You may begin. Sarah, you want to start? Is this on? <laughs> Good morning, uh, Madam Chair and distinguished panel. Uh, sorry for the confusion. I must have filled up my form. <laughs> Nothing unusual. Um, I'm a formerly incarcerated a uh, woman who was Can you really identify yourself first? Your name? Oh, my name is Rosalie Cutting. I served 27 years in a state facility, and I was released at the age of 70. Uh, I was released on a de novo hearing um, and was represented by Morningside Heights Legal Services, and two uh, Columbia students represented me and won the argument with the Supreme Court Justice who honored all the points. Uh, and it set a precedence for those that follow me. Um, it was, I really am passionate about uh, the reintegration process uh, for the formerly incarcerated and those to be released. Uh, I think uh, one human right is to have a safe, appropriate place to lay one's head when one is returned from prison into the community. It's not asking a lot. Uh, it's nothing luxurious. It's just that safe place. Uh, I'm responsible for the crime I committed. I uh, would never try to justify it. And each step I take, I think about my victim and my victim's family. Um, those of us that have been incarcerated for a number of years, uh, we have learned uh, a lot about ourselves and our potential, and we pick up the responsibility and step forward and stand for the responsibility for what one has done. Um, I made bad choices, and that's how I ended up there, so I'm not blaming anyone but myself. I want to make that perfectly clear. Um, I, I think when, when I was released, when I first got from the parole board after that special de novo, the hearing, um, uh, in, uh, almost three years ago now, uh, I was just elated that instead of being denied parole, I was granted parole. So in preparation for that, all my, my plans for release kind of fell apart, which is not unusual. Uh, but friends of mine for almost 40 years stepped up to the plate and uh, welcomed me into their home. So they were the ones that welcomed me at the gate. Upon re, uh, leaving the facility, I remember all the women cheering, and I went walked through the gates after 27 years with an officer that had kind of done time with all of us. And I remember turning around, hearing those voices, and then looking down the hill at my friends picking me up, thinking, oh my gosh, what do I do now? 
Inside, I could navigate. I developed programs, went to college, mentored many women who were searching for their own potential and searching for themselves, who they are and where they're going, bridges they had burned. Um, and for the women, and I know for the men is, is totally different from us and our needs, but for women, it was bonding with their families. Uh, I worked for the family reunion and DMV and the puppy program and everything that was possible that was positive inside and encouraged my sisters inside to move ahead because they had permission now to do it. While that seems a little bit strange, it is for women who have been beaten down most of their lives. That's not a justification in any way as to why they were incarcerated, but they just felt that way because of choices they made and what they were faced with. So during my time and then in, in being released, uh, after 27 years, I ended up at Costco's. Uh, that was overwhelming for me. The technology, the web didn't come in until 1994 was my understanding. We had dumb computers inside, and I worked on those computers, but it was nothing uh, what I was prepared for coming out. The prices on milk when I went into the system was 98 cents a gallon. And coming out, what is it, $5 or $6 a gallon? So I was faced with handling money. Um, I was also faced with housing, which is a big thing for those who have been formerly incarcerated uh, coming back into their communities uh, because no one wanted to rent to me because of my past. Employment was the same way. We have block the box, but they can look, they can pull you up on a computer and while they won't state that that is the reason they will not hire you, you don't get employment. I was blessed with friends that um, stepped forward, and I did volunteer work for an architect in Queens, so I kind of started learning about all those necessities with the computer and walking the grid in New York City. I'm from upstate, so I had to master the subway. I also this sounds kind of crazy, after 27 years going into a public laboratory and, and panicking because there was nothing to flush the toilet, somebody screamed out, walk away. So I walked away and kept walking away for 10 minutes because I couldn't believe the toilet flush itself. Um, but those are part of the ridiculous things for some people, but for me it was a big thing. And at 70 years old, I was facing 71. And then, and then it was, what am I going to do? I'm, not, I'm tenacious, so I thought, well, you know, I'm, I'm not going to feel bad about all this. I'm going to stand back up like my dad always told me, who was a veteran. Get on your feet and move ahead. So that's what I did. Went to Fortune Society. While there are many agencies out there that are helpful, uh, Fortune Society uh, assisted me all the way to my, my employment at Black Veterans. Um, I learned my computer skills, I picked it up, and Miss Wendy McClinton, who was a former veteran herself and CEO of Black Veterans, uh, it was a homeless person, totally understood those needs and gave me that second chance. And that's all we're asking for is a second chance. So I totally stand behind the whole movement, especially with rap because they are a positive force, and I believe, uh, I would hope anyway, with the respect I have for our mayor and the council members, that they would step up and support the release of elderly people in prison to be released, and for those formerly incarcerated, the support they need when they are released, because it was a real struggle without friends and family. I can't imagine being out all by myself at my age uh, and being successful. Uh, it, it's just, it's really difficult. And I'm not saying, feel sorry for me because that is not the way it is. I'm not a victim and I'm a real strong woman who stood up and I'm standing up for the rights of those that are still waiting to be released. Thank you so much for allowing me to speak. Thank you. Hello, my name is Safia Bandelli. I work with the RAP organization. I'm very pleased and prou proud to be involved with RAP, which I think is the pioneer, the leader of this movement. I'm also retired from Medgarvis College CUNY, 
and my testimony references my 34 years of experience at Medgar Evers College, where I served not only as a classroom instructor in the humanities, but also as director of the college's pioneering campus-based Center for Women's Development. The center earned the reputation as a social justice organization promoting not only gender equity, but informally providing a space for people released from New York State prisons to visit for support and information. Because my loved one, Ibn Kenyatta, was and still is incarcerated, I have deep knowledge of incarceration issues as well as higher education. Thus, the return and formerly incarcerated found a welcoming and knowledgeable um, person, persons in our center. Four of these people who returned, Marvin Calvin, Melvin Thompson, Chris Brunson, and Freddie Sutton, each had been sentenced early in their lives. Each had done long bids over 20 years. Each had exemplary institutional records when they were paroled to the community, Brooklyn community. Each of these men had experienced health issues as they grew older in prison. Upon their release, the substandard prison medical, medical care exacerbated these illnesses. Each of these four men spent hours in my office as we discussed life outside and their options and the collateral consequences of incarceration. Each of these four men died shortly after release. Two had had housing problems, including stints in shelter. The others had not. Research has estimated the years that prison adds to one's chronological age. Thus, my friends were in the older adult category. And because we live in a youth-focused society, the issues facing older persons are usually marginalized. This is one reason 1616, the CARE Act, is so very important. Just establishing this task force to examine issues related to post-incarceration sends a powerful message that this cohort, the marginalized within the marginalized, should be recognized. The absence of the older formerly incarcerated individual on civic and community-based and city organizations is, frankly, deplorable. How can the lives of all citizens matter when this group is so overlooked legislatively, including the community boards? Medgarver's College and RAP hosted a symposium several months ago on this issue. To Medgar's credit, the administration expressed interest in becoming more involved through research and direct action. Specifically, the nursing and social work departments are ready to contribute to the work of RAP and the CARE Task Force when it's established. Medgar Evers has a history of compassion and assistance for the formerly incarcerated. And cleaning out my files, I found this record from March 1993. We had a forum on the great Fannie Lou Hamer. And at that time, we advertised for a community-based coalition to discuss criminal justice issues entitled Changing the Criminal Justice System Through Community Empowerment. The forum was held Saturday, April 3, 1993. I was a speaker along with the formerly incarcerated brother, Asala Gibson. From that's almost the quarter of a century ago, we are still, I mean, just to establish this task force is major. And so we thank you, Commissioner, um, Commissioner, you should be Commissioner. We thank you, Council Person, for your leadership as well as DROM. So this is the, uh, my friends who are now ancestors, Freddie, Chris, Melvin, and Marvin, you know, they would applaud today's events and they will talk about this is one of the positive collateral consequences that here a city agency is taking notice. More of the city council people should get on board with this and that is our job at RAP to make sure that that happens. But at least this is the beginning and to have the task force dedicated to older returning people from prison is a really, really great leap forward. Thank you very much. Thank you. Definitely deserve some applause. <laughs> hello, hello, you hear me? Mm -hmm. Good afternoon. Thank you, Sophia. That was very nice. Thanks, brother. Yes. Good afternoon. My name is James Royal, and I'm a reentry specialist from BDS, Brooklyn Defender Services. And before I begin, I just want to thank the City Council, 
I'd like to thank Chairperson Chen and, partic uh, and, the, and the Committee of, on Aging. And um, I would like to particularly uh, thank, although he uh, stepped out, uh, Council Member uh, Drum, the, the, the bill sponsor, for giving me the opportunity to testify on intro number 1616. The Book and Defendant Services, we strongly support the establishment of a task force for older adults. Those older adults that return to society and offers, and we also offer recommendations to strengthen this task force and this legislation. More than 10,000 people aged 50 or older are currently incarcerated in New York, according to the latest available data, and excusably, this number is rising. Advocates are pushing and influencing Governor Cuomo and the legislator to adopt reforms that would allow for many incarcerated older adults who have the lowest recidivism rates to be released. Led by this proposed task force, New York City can be an alley in the parole reform, resources in place to help individuals successfully return. Currently, there's a broad slate of programs that actually address these, prob these problems and services for older New Yorkers across the city and growing network of reentry resources, but very little overlap between those two. One organization that truly gets it right, we heard from today, was the uh, Fortune Society. We know the Osborne Association is on board with the, uh, the new facility that they are uh, establishing in Fulton. And however, the um, the issues and the providers is, is far more than what we know. We, we need more than just one or two providers that, to address this particular issue of older adults returning to our society as citizens. We at BDS, we have four recommendations to strengthen this legislation. And one additional recommendation for an advance, that's in advance, excuse me, we have one additional recommendation to offer in advance for the task force. First, the task force should remain in place for at least five years to be able to monitor the implementation of the recommendations that they make. It is forthcoming report and hold policymakers accountable with additional progress reports. Second, BDS believes that at least half of its members should have close personal experience with incarceration, either through their own incarceration or that of a family member. The agency officials and academics sought for the task force in the current bill language have a variety of variable expertise and they should make, and make any and all data and information available to the task force as the bill requires for them to do so, but those who have lived through the challenges of reentry should be on the front lines of identifying the solutions. We heard from a, a, a couple of individuals tonight that spoke to the fact that some or are, are, are many individuals that's older adults, that's over 50 years old, they have the tendency of educating themselves and rehabilitating themselves once they are incarcerated. Um, of course, the state prisons does have basic programs for rehabilitation, but that's what they are. They are basic. Beyond that, the first two or three years of incarceration, those programs are no longer available to older adults or everybody that has basically resolved that issue. There's more rehabilitation to be done, and most people do it themselves. Um, these are the individuals that, are, that have the ability to help with the recidivism rate. These are the, these are the individuals that have the ability to help with the, with the juvenile and the youth and the recidivism rate that is so high among that group. Such, the, uh, the third, the third um, recommendation that we would have for the task force should also include at least one provider of affordable housing and one provider, provider of supportive housing. Our clients' experiences affirm the reality that stable housing is the key to successful reentry. Yet 58% of older adults 
which is 16, oh, about 1,600 of them, were homeless upon release, and nearly 12, 1,200 went directly to a homeless shelter. And as we heard from releasing aging people in prison, those statistics came from them. They have done the research. Such unstable housing can disrupt medication and therapy regimes, regimens, and adherence. It can impose additional unnecessary restrictions like curfews and add to overall volatility and stress of being poor in New York City and subject to widespread discrimination in employment and in elsewhere. Lastly, the bill should be should require that the task force explore the unique challenges of reentry for people convicted of sex offense, especially older adults, mm -hmm. and make recommendations to the state regarding the movement and residency restrictions for this population. While there are substantial political challenges associated with assisting this population with reentry, public safety reforms and fairness demands reconsideration of years of policy that ultimately is not linked with positive outcomes or increased public safety. The restrictions should include the Sarah and the Sora generally prohibits the restrictions included in the Sexual Reform Act, Sarah, and the Sexual Offender Registration Act generally prohibits offenders from knowingly entering any area within a thousand feet of schools or facilities primarily used by people under the age of 18. In short, they do nothing to prevent sex offenses from occurring and in fact, it can increase risk of reoffending by preventing affected individuals from obtaining stable housing, employment, or assessing treatment, and even mandatory parole office appointments. This has a direct impact on New York City government, which is required by court order to provide shelter and often fails to do so while complying with these restrictions. Likewise, the state prison system requires a home address to release an individual to parole but often fails to identify a viable and compliant one. The shocking result is that people in state prisons are sometimes held beyond the end of their sentence until a SARE compliance residence is found. BDS has successfully litigated to remove some SARE restrictions for Oh, excuse me. Reentry, um, so the shocking result is that people in state prisons are sometimes held beyond their sentence until Sarah compliance residence is found. BDS has successfully, has successfully litigated to remove several restrictions for one client, but border reform is still urgently needed. Reentry is not about the crime of conviction, which is the one thing that cannot be changed, but rather the rehabilitation and reintegration of the individual. Reentry is a process of leaving a correction facility or any state locale or custody and returning to society. Once this task force has been established, BDS will have additional recommendations for members. One area in need of urgent reform that we will highlight and that is critical to our clients and their families is prison visiting. Maintaining tight support networks while incarcerated can be both extremely difficult and extremely beneficial for people on both sides of the prison walls. The biggest challenge to maintaining these networks is a direct result of choices made by policymakers, namely the placement of prisons in regions of the state New York State used to mitigate this problem by offering free visiting buses to families, and they should be restored as soon as possible. Legislation do, to do just that is pending in Albany, and the council should urge Governor Cuomo and legislature to include it in the state budget this coming session. Substantial research has shown that consistent visitation is one of the primary drivers of rehabilitation and protection against recidivism. It is well worth the investment. So I thank you for considering my comments. I look forward to continue working with the council to support the creation of this task force and to ensure that it is effective. Thank you.
Thank you very much for your testimony, um, your personal experience, and your support for this legislation in terms of setting up this task force. We will look forward to continue to work with you to make sure this happens. Because um, right now, you heard from the administration, um, the support is not there yet. Right. But by working together and navigating together and working together with the bill sponsor, Councilmember Drum, he will, we will make sure that he gets all the information from the testimony today because he's chairing the, the committee hearing next door. Um, and we will um, work with you to make sure that the legislation is passed. And thank you so much for your recommendations. And that's the negotiating you know, process that will go on uh, with the legislation. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And thank you for being here today. Thank, thank you. you so You're much. Is there anyone else that would like to testify that has not okay. filled out a form? No? Well, once again, I want to thank everyone who testified today, and we look forward to working with you to get all this legislation passed. Thank you. Thank you. The hearing is adjourned.